Hi everyone. Welcome to our October for the Springs Speaker and Performance Series. Um, first, a reminder on our webinar housekeeping. All audience members are muted for this performance, this presentation. We have the Q&A tool that you can post your questions and at the end of um, Bob's talk, um, you will address those questions. I'm Renee. I work, I'm on the board of the Friends of Call Springs. And um, we're really excited to bring you this free series so all of us can come together and enjoy some of the natural and cultural resources the Springs has to offer. Tonight, um, we have um, Dr. Bob Dials here. And I'm going to pass my virtual mic over to Amy Connors, our park manager, who will be introducing you to Bob. Amy? Thank you, Renee. I am honored to welcome Bob Dial. Bob is a valued volunteer at Wakulla Springs State Park and was named Volunteer of the Year for Resource Management in 2017. He is currently managing the park's volunteer wildlife monitoring program and has also served as one of our regular tour boat guides. A professor emeritus of environmental planning at Florida State University, he retired in August 2013. He currently serves as chair of the Wakulla Springs Alliance. He holds degrees in biology, environmental management, and environmental science. Bob has been a tremendous asset to the park in so many ways through research, interpretation, data compilation, friendly conversation, and a willingness to help in any way that he can. We are so glad to have him share his many talents and his knowledge, and now I will get out of his way so that he can do just that. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. All righty, well, we're gonna do a little screen share here. There we go. So um, as we all know, alligators are uh, one of the major draws for visitors to Wakulla Springs. Um, but uh, as one of the top predators on the river, they uh, may also be an important bellwether of the health of the spring and uh, river ecosystem. So uh, what I'd like to do uh, with you this evening is share some of what we've learned about the wildlife diversity and abundance on the Upper Wakulla River from continuous monitoring uh, for over 25 years. Um, and this evening we'll focus on alligators and a few other key species. Um, as you may know, uh, park staff began surveying wildlife along the riverboat tour route way back in 1992, once a month. Um, and that went on for um, 20 years until November 2012 when uh, Bob Thompson um, put together a weekly monitoring program staffed by volunteers. And so we've been monitoring uh, wildlife now weekly ever since November 2012. Um, I took over as coordinator and data manager analyst in 2018. The um, information I'm going to present this evening is drawn primarily from the uh, 2019 uh, semi-annual report that I prepared. And uh, if you uh, are interested in getting into that, uh, you can find copies, digital copies of it on the uh, Friends of Wakulla Springs uh, website and the uh, uh, Wakulla Springs Alliance website. Um, I do want to acknowledge as I get started here that um, all but one of the photos you're going to see this evening uh, were taken by uh, Bob Thompson. And um, I want to thank him uh, as always, for being so generous with uh, his creative talents um, and letting us appreciate these uh, amazing photographs that he takes. So um, this is the big picture. Um, Long-term trends in wildlife species counts per survey uh, from 1992 to 2018. Um, what we've uh, observed over that time period is that uh, 14 species have shown uh, statistically significant declines in abundance uh, since 1992 through 2018. 
and you see them there. Um, four species have uh, experienced um, statistically significant increases over that time period, um, and six species uh, have gone up and down, but um, with no statistically uh, significant trend. So we're going to start out with alligators here and uh, take a look at what we've, uh, what we've learned about them. And um, then we'll, uh, we'll look at some other, some other critters as well. Um, as you probably know, uh, alligators are generalist carnivores. I've read that uh, not only do they eat uh, deer and people, but they uh, will also eat snails and uh, pretty much everything in between. Um, I've actually seen an alligator take a deer on the Wakala River in the course of a, a day of riverboat tours a number of years ago. But um, they're of interest to us um, because uh, as one of the top predators, um, changes in their abundance are probably indicative of the aggregate changes in the biological productivity of the spring and the, and the river ecosystem. If there's plenty of food to go around, uh, because the alligators are not very picky about what they eat, um, we're going to see plenty of alligators. And if there's not a lot of food around, um, we would expect uh, the alligator numbers to go down. Um, so here we have a, uh, a graph of um, uh, American alligator um, annual mean. So this is the uh, annual mean number of alligators counted on each of the surveys that were uh, completed in that year. And um, you can see uh, the red line here, which is a uh, ordinary least squares regression line fitted to the data points, um, shows a visible decline over this uh, period from 1994 to 2018. Uh, the reason the statistics were done starting in 1994 is because we had incomplete data in 92 and 93. We didn't have a full years of data in either year. And uh, since this is a plot of annual means, um, i drop those off the front end. Um, and what we see here statistically is, um, we got a, a statistically significant model. Uh, the F test um, probability is less than 0 0.001. That means that it's significant at uh, better than the 99.9% .9 level of confidence. So very confident that we do have a legitimate uh, relationship going on here. And the R squared statistic there of 0 0.562 means that the um, change over time uh, explains 56%, sorry, the passage of time uh, explains 56% of the observed uh, variation in the abundance of alligators. Um, and uh, this pattern that we see for the alligators is uh, consistent with the overall pattern uh, of abundance of all of the species that we monitor. So now we're looking at um, a similar plot from 94 to 2018, but now the data points are the mean total number of animals counted per survey. So that every single moorhen and uh, pied-billed grebe and snake and turtle all added up together the annual mean number of animals counted. Um, so uh, once again, we do see a statistically significant uh, relationship here based on that F test at the 99.9% .9 level. But we see um, a lot of variation here, this great big peak in 1999. And, um, and then it starts to slope off a little bit, but still pretty high. Uh, and then we got a big dip here in the early 2000s, bump up to a peak here in 2006, um, down again, up again, and um, I'm gonna move the box here so I can see. And on over to uh, 2016, where we start to see the beginnings of what looks like maybe an upward trend. <clears throat> so um, this chart's uh, kind of fun. It's, uh, it's what's called a stacked graph. And what I've shown here are the uh, total um, annual mean counts for the 10 most prevalent species, and they're, they're layered on top of each other like a, like a layer cake. So down here on the bottom, this blue line is the alligators, and then the orange is the coots, and then the gray are the American widgeons. And what we see here is that the American widgeon 
uh, has a lot to do with that big peak in 1999 and what was going on uh, all the way over here into the mid 2000s. And the other critter that seems to have been pushing this pattern a fair degree is the uh, American coot, uh, which shows up as this orange layer in the cake. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, we did was we, we pulled the, um, uh, the Widgeon data out um, to see if it was just the Widgeon data that was pushing everything around. If we take the Widgeon data out and rerun the statistics, we still see a statistically significant decline um, in total uh, wildlife abundance between 94 and 2018. But it's this uh, pattern that, that really caught my interest here. Um, and um, so what I've gone after in the analyses that I did was trying to figure out what happened here in 1999. Why did things increase uh, and then start tumbling and just keep on going uh, down, down to 2015 and then begin to maybe improve. So to, um, to go after this question, um, I took a look at the, um, the change patterns for the species we've been monitoring. And um, what, uh, what this chart shows is that um, a total of uh, 17 species, if you add up all of these green bars here, uh, we got two species here, three species there, two here, uh, four and five. If you add that up, that's 17 species. 17 species attained their initial peak abundance during this time period between 1994 and 2000, represented by this green line here. So there were a lot of species that were increasing in number um, and, and attained a peak for the entire 20-something um, years of, uh, of data. In the next stretch here, between um, 1999 and 2009, um, we have a cluster of uh, breakpoints uh, represented by these orange bars. And breakpoint is the year before the abundance of that species took a big tumble. Um, so we got, we got some breakpoints here in the beginning, but we got a big cluster of breakpoints here. And then things start to sort of flatten out as we get past uh, 2009. Well, based on this pattern and, um, and um, what I know about some of the major ecosystem perturbations that have occurred uh, on the uh, upper Wakulla River, um, I defined uh, three uh, what I call environmental perturbation periods. The first one I've labeled the hydrilla invasion period from 1992 to 2000. Um, and I'll talk more about each one of these in a moment. The uh, second period uh, between 2000 and 2012, I've labeled the hydrilla management period. And then the last period from 2012 to 2018, uh, very creatively titled the post hydrilla uh, management period. Uh, let's take a look at what, uh, what defines each of these. Um, the hydrilla invasion period from 1994 to 2000. Um, from 94 to 96, uh, prior to that, um, um, prior to and during the hydrilla invasion. So the hydrilla invasion starts more or less around 1997. That's when uh, the density got high enough for uh, park folks to start uh, uh, being concerned about it. Um, and um, during this time, because of the way hydrilla grows, it's rooted on the bottom, but it grows all the way up to the surface, and then it grows across the surface. So it forms, if you've been around when this stuff was happening, you know what it looked like, these carpets of hydrilla all the way across the surface, and that shaded out the native um, um, submerged aquatic vegetation. Well, the park began um, concerted mechanical removal in 1998, um, trying to uh, get this stuff out of there. And if I had time, I'd show you some incredible pictures of the great big piles of hydrilla uh, that were removed back then. But during this time period, um, what we do see um, from uh, 1994 to 2000 is that the total wildlife abundance increased significantly. Um, we had nine species that, that had increasing trends, two species decreasing, and 13 exhibiting no trend at all. And uh, that's reflected back there in the graph with the green bars and the, uh, and the orange bars. The, uh, the second uh, 
environmental perturbation period, again, is the hydrilla management period uh, from 2000 to 2012. Uh, during this time, mechanical removal was continued. Uh, eventually, they started using the, um, the big uh, harvesting machine that, uh, that went out there and mowed the, uh, mowed the hydrilla out. Um, and uh, that, as you may know, uh, just wasn't uh, doing the job. And uh, eventually the park decided with uh, quite a bit of, of, um, of consultation with, uh, with DEP and Fish and Wildlife Commission, decided to try applying herbicides and ended up uh, applying large scale uh, liquid aquathol treatments between 2002 and 2010. The initial treatment though, um, the initial broad scale liquid treatment um, in 2002 killed off 70 to 80% of the standing crop of hydrilla. Um, what it didn't do was kill off the roots of the hydrilla, but this big mass of hydrilla uh, was killed off and washed down the river over the course of several days. And um, one of the attending um, uh, effects was a large scale scouring of the main river channel. All this hydrilla moving down the river um, and the water that was dammed up behind it actually scoured the bottom of the river um, and, um, and actually not only scoured up the sediments, but some of the rooted aquatic vegetation as well. Um, we did see significant shifts in the submerged aquatic vegetation uh, during this time period um, because um, Many species, including the two most dominant um, species, the eelgrass and the spring tape grass, were um, killed back by the herbicides along with the hydrilla. Um, but the algae uh, bounced back the quickest every year, and so we began to see the formation of dense algal mats uh, on the sediments of the river. We had two crayfish kills associated with herbicide treatment, a pretty large one in 2002 and a smaller one in 2008. And in the midst of all this, the manatee showed up um, and uh, began um, grazing the hydrilla. And I'll tell you more about, uh, about the, the timing of the manatee. Um, but they would end up playing an important part during this uh, hydrilla management period. Um, and um, by the end of this time period, 2011-2012, uh, the uh, aquathol treatments were uh, much more limited and um, there have not been any since 2012. Hence, uh, that's the break point uh, for our third um, category. But uh, the big picture here during the hydrilla management period, uh, total wildlife abundance decreased significantly. Um, four species increased, 12 species had statistically significant decreases during this period, and eight species exhibited no trend. So the last period, the post hydrilla management period, um, uh, begins in 2012 and runs through 2018, um, because that's as far as this analysis goes. Um, in addition to the end of the um, uh, herbicide treatment, uh, we did see a big change in the nitrogen loading coming into the spring uh, as a result of the $227 million that the city of Tallahassee spent on reducing the nitrogen being discharged at the spray field. Um, the last herbicide treatment was uh, May of 2012, um, because at that point, um, the combined effects of less nitrogen and the um, grazing of the manatee uh, kept the hydrilla in check and no further chemical treatment was necessary. But uh, we did then see subsequently a decline in manatee numbers because uh, there wasn't as much fertilizer going into the system. Uh, there wasn't as much to eat. Um, now, the other thing that happened here, and I put this in here just because it might have had some effect on the data, um, 2012 is also the year that we began the shift from uh, monthly surveying to weekly surveying. So our data are much more robust uh, from there on out um, and probably a little bit more accurate as a result. So there's always a chance that some of these improvements in this post hydrilla management uh, time period may be due to more accurate data. Um, but the overall um, picture is that the total wildlife abundance did in fact continue to decrease, has continued to decrease 
uh, during this time period. Uh, seven species, however, have increased, eight species have decreased, and nine species have exhibited no trend. So, um, the, um, the decline in uh, biological productivity of the upper Wakulla River system uh, that's um, suggested by this pattern um, is consistent with uh, the drastic changes in the um, submerged aquatic vegetation community, which of course is the foundation of the food web. Um, as I mentioned, um, the hydrilla invasion itself led to changes because of the shading out of the rooted aquatic vegetation. Um, and the dominant species again are the American eelgrass, uh, Valisneria americana, and the spring take grass, the um, Sagittaria curtsianum, I believe it is. Um, and as I mentioned, um, the, um, the individual herbicide treatments killed back the hydrilla, but also killed back um, the eelgrass and the spring tape grass, as well as uh, a number of the other um, submerged aquatic species. And um, they all came back, but at different uh, rates of speed every year. Um, but the algae came back fastest. The algae were able to uh, take advantage of the available nutrients. And we got this, these dense mats of, of, uh, of algae uh, covering the bottom. Um, those algal mats are not as pervasive now as they were uh, five or six years ago, and presumably that's uh, because of the decrease in nitrogen uh, coming into the system. So that's the, uh, that's the story on these three um, uh, intervention periods. Let's go back to the alligator here and see how it fared during each of these time periods. Uh, again, here's the, uh, the chart of uh, uh, alligator annual mean counts per survey. Um, and we did previously see uh, a single trend line going through this data that, that was statistically significant. But uh, now let's take a look at uh, each of these three time periods. During the hydrilla invasion, um, while it appears to have gone up from 21 to 44 and 39 and kind of dribbled along here, this is not a statistically significant pattern. So um, the change during the hydrilla invasion period for the alligator was, uh, was not statistically significant. But when we move into the hydrilla management period, we do see a significant uh, decrease uh, in abundance of the American alligator. Um, and um, pretty robust to R squared there, 59.6% of the observed variation in alligator counts is explained simply by uh, the passage of time. Um, but uh, its uh, numbers began to turn around in 2013 here. Whoops. Well, I hate it when that happens. Um, I got to go back. There we go. Um, we've, uh, we've seen a, a very gentle increase since 2012 through 2018, but it is uh, statistically significant. Um, and uh, again, a pretty robust uh, R squared here, 88% of this variation is explained simply by the, uh, the passage of time. So um, I take this as an as a, um, encouraging sign, uh, again, because the alligator is a generalist up there at the top of the food chain eating just about anything that comes along, doesn't really care if it's snails or deer or hide-billed grebes or baby gallinule or whatever. Um, that uh, the fact that their uh, abundance appears to be increasing um, suggests that maybe the biological productivity of the, of the upper river system uh, may be moving in the right direction here. But of course, we have to be careful not to uh, uh, get uh, too excited by just uh, data trends here. And it makes sense to look at uh, possible alternative explanations. Well, one possible alternative explanation is the choice of nesting locations by female alligators. Um, I've been driving river boats since uh, the spring of 2013, and sometime since I started um, driving river boats, we had two females that started nesting regularly along the riverboat uh, tour route. And um, when those uh, 
first hatches of babies show up, uh, you can sometimes get 20 or more babies hanging out with mama, and that, of course, would, uh, would boost the counts. Um, and in fact, uh, this year, uh, for a while, we were seeing juvenile alligators in the one to three-year-old range in three different places uh, along the riverboat tour route. Um, we uh, unfortunately have never kept formal data on, on nesting. Um, there's sometimes some comments on the data sheets, but um, um, we do not really know uh, the extent to which nesting behavior may be behind uh, the uh, trends that we're seeing recently. Uh, what we have done though is we've uh, we changed our, our protocol and we're now uh, separately recording the numbers of alligators that are um, three feet or, or that are less than three feet in length and that are three feet or more in length. So as we move forward, we're going to be able to um, have a better handle on the proportion of total alligators that are um, the little ones versus the adults. Well, it's also possible that um, the changes to the alligator's physical environment uh, may be involved in, this, uh, in these trends that we see and, and perhaps in this uh, apparent trend of increasing abundance since 2012. Um, so as previously noted, um, uh, there was a statistically significant increase in abundance um, um, since 2012. Um, but uh, in and of itself, um, it only explains 6% uh, of the observed variation in alligator counts between 2012 and 2018. Um, we do record two other uh, parameters uh, on every one of the surveys. We take a, a reading from the thermometer there at the, uh, at the patio at the uh, waterfront of the air temperature and we uh, read the staff gauge uh, on the T-Dock to uh, get a reading on how uh, deep the water is or how high the water is. Um, and um, we were very fortunate that uh, another uh, Another very active volunteer, Nico Wienders, uh, recently took the time to enter all these data from those, uh, from those survey sheets uh, into the database so that we're uh, now able to, uh, to see whether changes in air temperature or river stage have anything to do with the abundance of the alligators uh, that we observe. And in fact, what we do see is uh, that air temperature um, is statistically significant uh, predictor of alligator abundance at the 99.99% level or better. It's a positive relationship. So warmer air temperatures uh, leads to higher counts of alligators. Uh, again, the explanatory power is not, not that big, uh, but uh, it's, it's a factor that's going on there. Um, but when we look at river stage, um, it's going in the other direction. So the deeper the water or the higher the, the water better way to look at it, uh, the fewer alligators we see. And um, if you take regular riverboat rides, you know why that is. They're basking spots along the riverbank or underwater. Um, so they're, uh, they're not gonna be as visible. The explanatory power of river stage all by itself, again, is not very great. But if we put all three of these uh, variables together in a regression model, um, we, do, uh, we do get a, uh, a more robust explanation. So um, air temperature and river stage, as well as simply whatever changes are occurring in the ecosystem represented by the passage of time, uh, are all contributing to uh, what we observe uh, in the uh, alligator abundance counts. Well, so the next question is, um, are there any significant trends in air temperature or, or river stage? If we look at the uh, river stage data, again, from 2012 to 2018. Um, you see the red trend line here is pretty nearly flat. And in fact, um, it's not a statistically significant relationship. So the apparent increase in alligator abundance uh, is not due to a change in uh, river height or river stage uh, over this, uh, this time period. But if we look at temperature data, um, first of all, you'll notice this really funky pattern here. This is just a seasonal pattern of highs and lows in temperature. And um, 
even with all that noise, uh, we do have a statistically significant increase in the um, air temperature measured on, um, on uh, the days that we have uh, conducted the wildlife surveys. So it's likely therefore that um, some proportion of the observed um, increase in abundance of the alligators is associated with warmer air temperatures, um, which might mean that global warming is good for alligators. Who knows? Well, let's go back to the big picture again. Um, we're back to looking at the annual mean um, total animal counts per survey, 1994 to 2018. And um, we Notice here after 2012, we have a decline until 2015 and then the beginnings of maybe an improvement in this post hydrilla period. Um, but um, if, we, uh, if we run the statistics, um, in fact, the, uh, the change over this time period in total abundance is still a, a negative pattern. So uh, let's take a quick look at a few other species here. We've got almost 15 minutes left here. I want to start with the widgeon because you'll remember that the widgeon, um, American widgeon was um, um, behind that great big peak in 1999 and the high counts in a couple of years thereafter. Uh, and then it virtually disappeared. Well, an important thing about the widgeon, of course, is that it's a winter migrant. So rather than looking at uh, annual data, um, what we've looked at is just the abundance, um, the average monthly means um, for the four months when the widgeon are most, um, were most uh, abundant, November through February, November, December, January, and February. And if we look at uh, a plot now of uh, winter monthly means, uh, from November 93-94 through 2000-2001. Uh, so this is the, during the hydrilla invasion period, uh, we do see there was a statistically significant increase in um, American widgeon during that period. There's that 701 count um, from uh, 1999. That's the big peak in the overall pattern. Um, Widgeon eat uh, bugs and other things as well as plants during the breeding season, but um, I've read that during the non-breeding season, they're primarily eating plants. Um, and so it's, uh, it's possible that this trend reflects uh, an increase in food supply for the widgeon associated with the proliferation of the hydrilla. When we look at the um, the, um, the long-term trend, of course, uh, we see a uh, statistically significant decline uh, in the widgeon from 1993-94 to 2016-2017. Uh, uh, from that high of 701 here in 1999-2001 uh, to zero in 2012-2013 and zero ever since in terms of uh, winter monthly means. We've occasionally seen one or two. Um, I'm not sure anyone's seen one in the last three or four years at all. Um, so to what might we ascribe this uh, decline? Um, well, uh, my guess is that uh, this decline here probably associated with the, uh, the onset of the effective aquathol treatment, herbicide treatment that uh, knocked back the uh, knock back the hydrilla. Um, this is at least plausible, um, but um, because this is a winter migratory species, we do have to also um, uh, remember that uh, the birds we see at Wakulla in the wintertime, uh, those numbers may be affected by things outside the Wakulla ecosystem, such as uh, summer breeding success, uh, weather encountered during migration, uh, and food availability along the way. And in fact, it turns out um, that uh, the southern boundary of the Widgeon's winter range has been shifting northward uh, for several decades, consistent with uh, what might be expected from the effects of climate change. Uh, and so part of what we've seen may be 
uh, the effect of the widgeon not coming this far south in the wintertime uh, as much as they used to. Um, and there's also been a long-term decline in total breeding populations of widgeon uh, in eastern North America, uh, which may have had something to do with what we're seeing as well. So we can't be absolutely certain that the widgeon story is um, purely uh, a story of uh, hydrilla as, a, as an important part of its uh, food uh, supply. Um, okay, so let's see who else we're gonna talk about here. Uh, let's go to the common gallinule. Um, this might be another bellwether for us. Um, Gallinule is at this point the most prolific uh, surface feeding plant eater after the demise of the widgeon. Um, it's another year round species um, that feeds primarily on uh, plants at the surface. Um, but it uh, turns out uh, from looking at these data, I had always sort of informally noticed that there seemed to be an increase of widgeon in the fall. And I always thought that was kind of odd because um, it seems like even though there's all those little chicks born in the summertime, they don't see a whole lot of those juveniles around by the time we get to October. Um, I think they're mainly uh, incorporated into the bodies of alligators at that point. Um, but we do in fact see higher numbers in September, October, November, December, and January. And if you look at the range maps, in fact, uh, it shows that uh, um, common gallinule migrate from the eastern uh, Mid-Atlantic and Southern states to Florida in the wintertime. Now, it never occurred to me that, uh, that uh, a, um, a common gallinule could fly well enough to migrate, and I don't think I've ever seen one fly far enough to even get uh, 100 yards down the river, but it turns out they do migrate, uh, but they do it at night so that nobody will see what ungainly flyers they, they probably are. Um, but here again, we see a statistically significant uh, long-term decline in abundance um, in the uh, gallinule. Uh, similar peak uh, back there in 1999, and then a drop-off coincident with the, um, with the herbicide treatments. Um, no statistically significant increase during the hydrilla invasion period, uh, but the peak uh, was in 1999. Um, and it started declining right away. And that may be because the mechanical harvesting of the hydrilla um, actually started to disrupt the access of the um, gallinules to that uh, important food supply for them as well. A statistically significant decrease during the hydrilla management period, uh, during the herbicide treatment, and um, uh, a turning point in um, 2015 and the beginnings of, a, of an increase after that, but um, this latter trend is not statistically significant um, at the moment. Okay, um, now I'd like to look at one of our success stories. Um, here's uh, one of my favorite critters and I, one of Bob Thompson's most exquisite photographs of all time, I think, of this, uh, this lovely pied bill grebe. You can make out every single little feather on its head and all these ripples here in the water. Um, this is another species that, as it turns out, is probably augmented by uh, visiting cousins in the wintertime. If we look at the, uh, the, the monthly patterns, but I'm not going to take the time to do that. Um, just want to share with you a little bit of what, uh, what we have observed. Um, so um, the pied bill grebe has um, experienced a significant long-term increase in abundance, um, both in terms of year-round numbers, uh, but also if you look separately at just the breeding season from April to August, we have a long-term increase, um, but we also have a long-term increase during the non-breeding season from September to March. Um, so um, this, uh, this would suggest that uh, things are good all year round uh, for, uh, for the pied bill grebe. Um, we did see significant increases during the hydrilla management period. So even though uh, we were fooling around with uh, herbicides and, um, and uh, the hydrilla was disappearing and other things were moving around, um, we still saw significant increases in the year round uh, counts and in the non-breeding season. 
Um, and that's despite the fact that we had those two crayfish kills in 2002 and 2008, uh, crayfish being one of the um, primary food sources uh, for the, uh, for the pied billed grebe. In fact, we do see that um, there were two declines that lagged right after those crayfish kills. So the crayfish kill in 2002, we saw um, a decline in pied bill grebes the following winter, and the crayfish kill in 2006 was followed by uh, a decline as well. So some perhaps impact, uh, but not enough to uh, break up the long-term uh, trend. Um, so it's also possible that um, this trend has uh, less to do with what's happening in Wakulla and more to do with what's happening with uh, pied bill grebes in general. Um, just the opposite of the widgeon, the uh, pied bill grebes um, wintering territories are actually moving south over the last several decades, um, and their breeding populations in the east have been um, increasing. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead to manatee here and then we'll wrap this up. Um, this, of course, is our uh, number one charismatic uh, megafaunal species. Um, and it's a particular interest uh, to me because um, it kind of showed up in the middle of everything, um, but appears to have had important impacts on what's going on in our ecosystem because of its uh, taste for hydrilla. So, um, the data um, don't go back all the way to 1992 for manatee. Um, we did see a statistically significant increase in annual means uh, during the hydrilla management period. Um, but they, uh, they were first observed in the park in 1997 um, and appeared sporadically in small numbers until 2003. Um, and that's the first year that uh, they started appearing on our uh, wildlife monitoring surveys on a regular basis. So we don't have any data on manatee during the so-called hydrilla invasion period uh, prior to 2000. Um, and they weren't included on the survey form uh, formally until 2007. So uh, the data uh, prior to 2007 um, are, are, are incomplete. Um, so here I'm basically showing you the pattern between 2007 and, and 2018. They uh, overwintered at the spring for the first time in the winter of 2007, 2008. Um, and as you see here, there was a steady increase in annual monthly means uh, from 2007 uh, to 2012 uh, during the hydrilla management period. Peak uh, um, annual mean was 12 in 2012, corresponds to the year that um, the nitrogen uh, content went down because of the improvements of the um, uh, Tallahassee sewage treatment plant. And then we see the um, manatee counts declining. Uh, again, we suspect that's because there was less hydrilla for them to eat. <clears throat> so, um, There's the limpkin. Uh, I'm going to take one minute, two minutes on the limpkin here. Um, to me, the limpkin's the bird, the critter we miss the most at Wakulla with its limping gait and its eerie cry. Um, but its story appears to be completely uncoupled uh, from this narrative that I've been spinning here around the other animals that we monitor. Um, their annual mean counts dropped to zero in 2000. Um, We've had occasional visitors since then, but not enough to um, generate annual means above zero. Um, most recently, we had uh, one or two limpkins on and off in, from February through May of 2020. Uh, Dana Bryan, who you may know, uh, uh, avid birder and uh, expert on the limpkin, uh, has hypothesized that the um, decline of the limpkin has been the result of the decline in its primary food source, the apple snail. Um, and that decline began in uh, 94 associated with uh, tropical storm barrel, if I remember correctly, and high water for several months, which um, led to the drowning of the eggs of the apple snails. 
um, on their, uh, the stems of the plants on which they grow. Um, and Dana has suggested that the, the failure of the limpkin to rebound uh, associated with the failure of the apple snail to rebound may be because uh, the limpkins do come back periodically and eat as many apple snails as they can find and then they eat mussels and then they leave. Um, and so it's, it's basically predation pressure that's, um, that's keeping the apple snails from bouncing back enough uh, for us to stay in limpkins. Well, um, I'd like to wrap up by summarizing the good news and the bad news. We'll start with the bad news first. Um, over this uh, time period, we've been monitoring uh, wildlife species. We've seen a total abundance uh, decrease of about 60%. Um, and we've seen continuing decreases over the uh, post hydrilla management period for um, four species, the widgeon, the common gallinule, the wood duck, and the osprey. Um, and we've seen three other species begin decreasing trends during this period, the cattle egret, the great blue heron, and the manatee. So we're clearly not on a road to recovery uh, with a number of species. Uh, but we do see encouraging signs um, for a number of other species during the last uh, seven years here. Uh, the alligator, the anhinga, the double-crested cormorant, the great egret, the hooded merganser, the pied-billed grebe, and the yellow-crowned night heron all have shown us uh, statistically significant improvements um, over the last, uh, the last seven years. Well, um, I hope to have the, um, the next uh, semi-annual report ready uh, around sometime in late February or early March, and um, we'll make sure those are available. That's available on the Friends of Bacala Springs website and the Bacala Springs Alliance website. But at this point, I think it's time to turn things over to Amy Conyers and uh, see what kinds of questions you all have. Great. Thank you, Bob. That was really interesting. And um, we've had some questions rolling in. So I think everybody is, is interested as well. I want to remind everyone if they have not gotten their questions in yet, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little box with Q and A and you can type your question there. It will be visible to me and I will read it to Bob so that he can enlighten us a little more. Um, so let's get started. One of the questions related to the apple snails, and I'll go right to that because you were just talking about the limpkin. Do, have you compared Patty's apple snail um, egg counts with this data? Do you know the effect of the herbicide on the apple snails? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I have looked at the, uh, the apple snail egg counts, which, um, I think, believe Scott Savory started uh, when he was the park biologist and Patty has continued. Um, I don't recall, I've got the graph somewhere on a different computer. I don't recall when they started the counts, um, but I think it was probably after um, they did some apple snail reintroduction, which I believe was in the mid 2000s, somewhere in there. Um, so I don't think we have, uh, egg count back to the beginning of the herbicide treatment period. Um, so that's a good question and, uh, and we, ought to, we ought to pull up a couple of uh, charts here and, and, and take a look there. Um, but um, I've not run into any um, information that would suggest that uh, Aquathol is um, toxic to uh, apple snails. Um, and for all um, intents and purposes, it's been gone now since 2012, and we didn't see a big rebound in apple snails after that. Um, we have seen a couple of setbacks uh, in the apple snail counts that then associated with high water events. Uh, Hurricane Dennis, which was back in 2005 or somewhere in there, um, we had another high water event and we saw a dip. Um, I think the peak in apple snail counts was around 2011. Um, oh, maybe Dennis was in 2010. Um, and then it's been on the increase again lately. Um, but uh, I think Dana's, Dana's hypothesis makes a lot of sense to me because it seems like when the apple snail egg counts go up, the, the limpkins show up shortly thereafter. <laughs> and um, 
and they stick around and we eventually we see them eating mussels and then they're then they're out of here. Um, another person asked about the apple snails. So more apple snails this year than before. Is there hope? Or maybe it was wishful thinking. But I think that's what our our data is showing an, an increase as well, if, if I'm correct. Um, but we're we may it may be too early to tell, right? Well, um, the, the most compelling photograph on the apple snail story that I have ever seen in the uh, state um, museum photo archives, um, there are hundreds of pictures from McCullough Springs. And one of those pictures is a picture of two young ladies in bathing suits posing on the big cypress tree that's just next to where the boat dock is. If you're looking down river, uh, right behind the glass bottom boat, there's a big cypress tree there. There's two young ladies in their bathing suits there and beneath their feet from the, where their feet are to the water, that cypress tree is solid white with, uh, with uh, apple snail eggs. Um, and some of the old timers have told me that they remember that all the pilings on, on the docks and everything completely covered with apple snail eggs. Uh, we're nowhere near that kind of density. Um, so we, uh, we got a long way to go. But uh, if, if Dana's right, we're gonna have to find a way to keep the Lincolns from eating the apple snails. <laughs> Um, so we can get a bigger population, or maybe maybe we need to think about more reintroductions and getting uh, just getting a larger stock of apple snails going, so uh, there's enough to feed the limpkins and enough to be there next year too. Apple snail, all you can eat buffet. There you go. <laughs> um, someone said that they found snails around Lake Jackson. Uh, they've seen limpkin eating them. Is it okay for them to eat snails from Lake Jackson? Um, I think a lot of the snails at Lake Jackson they're eating are the island apple snails, the invasive ones. Um, they seem to like them and it doesn't seem to hurt them any. I live near a, a little pond in the Benton Hills neighborhood of Tallahassee called Harriman Pond. It's a natural, natural pond. Um, does receive stormwater drainage. Um, we had a limpkin move in here there this summer after the island apple snails showed up for the first time. And um, those things are so prolific that that limpkin stayed all summer, about six months, just, just left recently um, eating those apple snails. You can tell the difference because the, um, the island apple snail eggs are, are bigger and they're uh, a much brighter pink mm -hmm. than the, uh, the native apple snails, which um, sometimes look pink in the right light, sometimes look just look white to me, and they're a good bit smaller. Oh, Dana Bryan is an attendee. <laughs> he go. chimed in right. that he also thinks that the disappearance of the limpkin was because of the repeated flooding that prevented any recruitment of apple snails, which only live one year. Hmm. Apple snails only live one year. Yeah, that's the problem. So if you wipe out realize. the you wipe out the egg crop, there's no adults around to lay eggs next year. Wow. Yeah. Hi, Dana. <laughs> Someone mentioned that they're from New York and not familiar with hydrilla. Um, and I think that may be related to another question that was broken up. So if species increase during the hydrilla invasion, isn't that a good thing? What is hydrilla and where does it come from? Oh, so hydrilla is a, um, it's an exotic plant from China, if I remember right. Um, and um, is, uh, was originally uh, brought to the U.S. for use in the aquarium trade as a uh, um, aquarium plant. And the story goes that a uh, aquarium plant dealer in Tampa received um, a bag full of hydrilla from a colleague in California who mailed it to him in, I believe it was 1955. And uh, this fellow uh, thought it looked interesting, but uh, didn't have any immediate use for it. So he stuck it in a little screened um, box, um, tied a string around it and threw it off the end of his dock um, so that it would have a place, because I guess there was a fair amount of it. So it would have a place to you know hang out until he was ready to mess with it. And by the end of several months, the entire canal that this guy lived on was uh, covered in hydrilla. 
um, and it's been it's been carried around since then by uh, by boat boat equipment, diving equipment, and birds most likely. Um, so it's not native, um, but it really thrives in, in this uh, in this environment. Great. I'm trying to keep up with all of these. I've got a lot of good questions. I think I've read about hydrilla, actually. Um, I'm pretty sure I recently saw an article. I'm from upstate New York, in fact, Rochester. And I'm pretty sure I saw an article recently about hydrilla in, um, I think, uh, Cayuga Lake, the, one of the big finger lakes. Mm -hmm. Hydrilla in, invasion in, um, in the, um, it would be the outlet from the lake at the south end of the lake there. So I think y'all may have it in New York also. <laughs> Watch out. Check a pond near you. Um, is the data that you have, the observations at Wakulla Springs applicable to nearby related ecosystems like Spring Creek or um, St. Mark's River? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't draw any, any inferences from what we've got to other places. Um, the um, U.S. Geological Survey, though, does have a, um, a database, uh, an annual database of uh, uh, bird counts, including all of our major species on Wakulla, um, that's published online. And they have the counts uh, broken down geographically by state, but also by county. So um, if you're interested, and that's actually something I want to do in the next uh, uh, version of this uh, report is compare Wakulla to uh, surrounding areas to see if if we're going one way and the other areas are going a, a different way. Um, yeah, we had a couple of questions along those lines. Um, can the scientific methodology you used at Wakulla Springs be adapted and perhaps useful to examine related ecosystems like the Appalachian Bay? and using other apex predators instead of gators like sharks or dolphins? Yeah, well, um, in order to draw inferences about a, um, a keystone species, um, if you want to call it that, or an apex predator, uh, you need to know something about the food web um, to know, uh, you know what, what it eats and where it is when it eats it. Um, I, uh, I have a son who's a um, biological oceanographer, and if you want to know about Appalachian Bay, um, mm -hmm. I'd refer you to him. <laughs> um, lakes and rivers are easier to study because the boundaries are so much more nicely defined for us. Um, when you talk about an estuarine ecosystem, um, you've got uh, so much flux with such a much larger area, it's a lot harder to pin down what's going on. Okay, we have lots of thank yous for the informative talk. Lots of words of praise here, so I hope you can review all of these when we're done. Um, someone says, thanks for the nice talk, Bob. Ecologists always use prey predator models to understand causality of population change. Has there been an attempt to develop such a model based on available data? Um. Yes, my son agrees with you, and no, we haven't tried. Um, and I, 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 don't, um, I don't think we have anywhere near enough data about uh, populations to do that. You would have to know about um, age classes and uh, a whole lot of other um, detailed information about the individual populations, I think, to be able to uh, untangle predator-prey relationships. We basically just count heads or tails. <laughs> Whatever you can see. <laughs> but I think, um, I do want to say, um, I think we're really fortunate to have this long-term database. Um, it's got its, you know, it's got its uh, measurement error dimensions to it, um, but a consistent methodology that's been executed for 27 years um, is, uh, I think, a real gem in terms of, of having a basis to uh, make some inferences about change anyways. Uh, of course, it's trickier to understand what's behind the change, but that's what makes it interesting. Yeah, it's, it's hard to know what you need to track when you're not seeing a problem. And it's hard to recognize a problem if you don't have the data. So um, 
what does go into making the decisions of what to track, what not to track? Um, now there's a question for whoever started the wildlife survey back in 92 and made the list of uh, <laughs> our species. We, um, we, did, we did tweak it. It's been tweaked a couple times. Um, we did tweak it in 2018 um, when I took over as the coordinator. Uh, we dropped out a couple species that are gone um, and we added a few that, that we see more, more routinely. Um, but um, I, you know, I think um, if I remember correctly, it was uh, um, it was members of the spring, the state spring council when Jim Stevenson was the head spring honcho that um, that uh, encouraged the park staff to initiate the wildlife survey in '92. So, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's where the where the uh, impetus for it came from. Um, but um, yeah, I, I can't explain w exactly why what's on there, but it's the stuff we see. If you go on a riverboat ride, you know, it's the stuff we see. Yeah. Do we have time for a few well, more, I Renee? Not, or? I did, did want to say one thing. It, the thing there's two things missing from, from our long-term data that, that I wish we had. One is, is, is long-term data on the submerged aquatic vegetation. Um, we started surveying that quarterly in 2012. It sure would have been nice if we'd started doing that back in 92. Um, and because all we can do is surmise from basically people's uh, recollections. Um, and, and the creature movies. Low, <laughs> low level, low, well, in a creature movie, exactly, or some of the low level air photos that were taken in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And take a look at those of that spring basin and what it looks like now. You can see some differences. Amy, the other let's, thing that, that's let's missing take a couple is, more questions. Yeah. Couple more questions? All right. Couple more questions. Okay. Let's keep it rolling. Um, so the total abundance curves look like there's an oscillatory behavior built on an overall decline. It kind of looks like a classical predator-prey relationship. Comments? Um, well, You're talking about the total annual animal abundance, I'd, I'd be more inclined to look at the at the patterns of individual species to make uh, hypotheses about predator prey relationships. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's possible, especially well. What you'd expect, I believe, though, is a little bit of a lag. Um, so as the as the prey population increases. Uh, then the predator population increases and starts eating everybody and then they eat too much and the prey population starts to decline and then the predator population declines behind it. Um, but uh, the problem is most of what's getting eaten is fish and those we don't have fish data. And alligators aren't great for predator prey relationships because they don't care what they're eating. They'll eat anything. Whatever's out there. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure we got the wherewithal to do that. Okay, one question, notes, it appears to be stabilizing in total mean count from 2004 to the current. Also, there appear to be cyclical peaks in total mean count population every seven years. What are some po possible reasons for that? I, I, I'd bet money on who asked this question. <laughs> I've I don't know the answer. It's listed I've as got anonymous. My <laughs> tropical ecologist friend Pam Hall. This sounds like a Pam Hall question. <laughs> um, Seven-year trends. Um, I I don't know unless unless rainfall is a factor, but um, I can't I can't think of any any major environmental factor that's likely to have uh, varied on on that kind of a. Of a, of a pattern, but um, it would be useful to slap the rainfall data on top of that and, and see certainly um, the rainfall have affected the apple snails because it's affected the water levels, um, but um, not sure about anything else. That's one reason why I wanted to look at the, uh, the river stage data 
um, because uh, the stage is primarily driven by rainfall patterns. And, um, and, and we certainly know that that's changed. And if you've been paying attention, uh, we, we were at over 3.2, I think, on the staff gauge here uh, about three weeks ago. Um, and they, the long-term average is about 1.6. So it was double. Um, so we got, we got some serious high water going on this year. Last year, we were in a prolonged drought. Um, one would think that those kinds of variations would be manifest in some uh, changes in biological productivity. Okay, someone said they thought they saw a report that stated that gators are increasing. Did I misread that? Um, on the McCullough River? Go back to my slide of the of the gators and the uh, the trend since 2012 is a statistically significant increase, going from something like uh, 12 an annual mean of 12 to an annual mean of 15 or 16, if I remember right. Do you know how that relates to alligator numbers across Florida? No, <laughs> but um, they don't migrate long distances like common gallinules, so. <laughs> right. Yeah, if wow. there's been an increase in, in small dog population, um, then maybe we've seen an increase in alligators statewide <laughs> as well. Wow, Bob, thank you. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to do this presentation for us. It's, you certainly got a lot of folks thinking and they're very interested. Mm -hmm. um, and you're leaving with us a lot of um, future potential opportunities to, to add to this, this rich oh, absolutely. already started. So thank yeah. you very much. Got any, uh, any would-be uh, wildlife survey volunteers out there? If you know your birds and your turtles and your manatee real well, um, we'd be happy to, to uh, train a couple more uh, volunteers. Um, we do the surveys on Saturday mornings on the 940 boat tour. And, Sounds like uh, someone did ask. Bird. Overall, what's the best way to help? And uh, that, that would be a great way to help. So if anyone is not already a member of the Friends of Wakulla, I would definitely suggest becoming a member. Um, you'll have access to a lot of the information about what's going on at the park. We also accept park volunteers and the quickest and easiest way to get enrolled as a volunteer is to go to the Florida State Park webpage and click on the how can I help link and submit a, an application online and then our volunteer coordinator will contact you and connect you with Bob if you're interested in wildlife monitoring. There you go, that's a great shout out for volunteers and, and for an opportunity to um, join the Friends of Acola Springs. Um, before we let everyone go, I want to let you all know that we have a very special Spooky Springs performance for you all on Halloween night. Please come, share, enjoy the specter of a cold spring as he appears and tells you tales of ghosts and haunted guest rooms. You know, you never know what goes bump in the night in the springs. November, we have, let me, um, we also have um, Casey McKinley coming and he will, he's with the Woodville Karth Plains Project. And he'll be sharing his mapping experience of the extensive cave system that McCall Springs is part of. So, thank you again for joining us this evening, everyone. Everyone, please stay safe. And hope you um, for help. Good night. Thanks, Renee. Oh, everybody's gone. <laughs> well, that was great. Thank you for inviting